In 1991, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the new Russian government was left with a failing economy and was in desperate need of money to pay its debts and the salaries of millions of workers. Russia had thousands of state-owned enterprises that were stagnant after decades of overproduction, overemployment, and no reinvestment into technology or social welfare. To clear its debt and prevent hyperinflation, the reformed government under President Boris Yeltsin came up with a plan to transfer the ownership of these state-owned enterprises to the general public through a process called privatization. The idea of this transfer of ownership was to introduce outsiders to these inefficient state-owned companies. These business-minded outsiders were expected to have different motives than the political elites they would replace, and focus more on transparency, growth, and prosperity, creating promise for the future of the economy. But after a few years of carrying out this plan, and as his term was coming to an end, Yeltsin and his administration was still in serious financial trouble, and he needed to come up with a new plan. He turned to a small group of extremely wealthy industrialists and bankers to help support him. These were known as the oligarchs. The first oligarchs rose to power in the late 80s and early 90s, when the Soviet Union was collapsing and Russia's economy was shifting to a free market through the privatization of state-owned enterprises. Although privatization was designed to transfer ownership of these enterprises to millions of Russian citizens, it ended up in the hands of a small group of savvy businessmen. The plan involved the government issuing vouchers each worth around 25 US dollars to 150 million Russians that they could pick up at a local bank. These vouchers could either be sold to another person or used as payment in auctions of enterprises being privatized. Vouchers could be submitted in an auction of a company being sold by the state in exchange for however many shares of that company it bought, depending on the bids. But after decades under Soviet rule, most citizens did not believe in this system and assumed the state would just take back control of these enterprises. This led them to just sell their vouchers to whoever was buying. The vouchers were freely tradable, so if a holder didn't want to exchange it for ownership in a company, they could sell it to another person or an investment firm. There were a few groups of well-connected people who were motivated to purchase large amounts of these vouchers from citizens, as it was an opportunity to gain immense control in this new economy. The largest group were the managers already in power at companies being privatized. Workers and managers of each of these companies immediately received 51% of the respective company's shares in most cases, with opportunity to buy additional shares at discounted rates. Managers would receive around 20% of the total shares and were able to accumulate even more by purchasing additional shares from the workers and through voucher auctions. Some managers had good morals and focused on maximizing the value of the company, even encouraging workers to keep their shares. Many others, however, exploited this restructuring for their own benefit, forcing workers to sell shares by delaying payments, manipulating auctions, and rigging shareholder votes. This was especially the case in companies being ran by Soviet elites, who were in many cases stealing assets, amassing negligent amounts of debt, and refusing to pay workers. Soviet elites also had the advantage of taking immediate control of the country's most lucrative resources. A Soviet minister of industry such as oil and gas already had the access to develop off of Russia's best oil fields and refineries, so as the Soviet Union collapsed, they could just leave the government to build a company and run that instead, carrying over all of their connections and power. It was extremely difficult for the masses to get any significant amount of ownership, and even if they did, their shares and voting rights held very little power or were manipulated through unclear regulations. The only group that had a chance at competing with factory managers or Soviet elites were the bankers. Post-Soviet bankers were oftentimes independently wealthy from their own success in commercial business and went on to create banks and investment firms around Russia. They were a small group, but had enormous power and could outbid most competition in voucher auctions. They were also highly motivated to reform these archaic enterprises as they could later sell them for a higher price. But because of its design, the mass privatization program failed to introduce a significant amount of outsiders into the majority of politically dominated companies and had very little positive impact on the economy. Savvy and sometimes amoral professionals took control of the most profitable industries including oil, natural gas, precious metals, and banking. Factory managers became factory owners overnight as state-owned shares were transferred to them. Soviet elites leveraged their position to take over the newly privatized companies, and bankers used their finances to acquire corporations before anyone else could. 
Dozens of people reaped billions from this new economy, but for a select few of these newly made oligarchs, their influence grew even more when the government needed further help. By 1995, the first mass privatization program still had not achieved the results the Russian government had hoped for, and the economy was still in a similar state it was in a few years prior. Yeltsin's government needed $800 million more to continue to prevent inflation, clear debts, pay workers, and to fund his campaign for re-election. He reached out to the wealthiest oligarchs in the country for help. Seven of Russia's most powerful oligarchs, all with ties to banking, devised the Loan for Shares program, a plan that involved the oligarchs giving loans to Yeltsin in exchange for shares in the most powerful corporations that Yeltsin was still holding on to. This scheme forced new managers into old companies, who had strong motives of turning them around. But it was tied to Yeltsin winning the election, because if the opposing party won, they would cancel the plan, keep the company state-owned, and revert back to a command economy. The oligarchs knew the government wouldn't be able to pay back these loans, but Yeltsin needed the support from the elites to win the election, and the oligarchs needed him to win. While this did give him enough money and support from business elites to get re-elected, his government still had large debts and was still responsible for millions of workers, as not every company had been privatized. When the government could not pay back the oligarchs' loans, it was forced to sell its most valuable corporations at low prices, giving the oligarchs full control of the most valuable companies in Russia. Now having control of banking as well as Russia's largest industries, the oligarchs' fortunes grew to immeasurable levels, and they now had decision-making power on the political level, as they were the ones funding the government. The mastermind of the Loan for Shares program that helped source the incredible wealth of oligarchs over the next 20 years was Vladimir Potanin. Potanin made his initial fortune during the first wave of privatization through an investment firm he called Interos, which acquired large stakes in mining, energy, and real estate. With the money he made through Interos, he opened Onexim Bank, which grew to become Russia's largest private bank and had many state-owned enterprises as clients. The banking influence he created put him in the perfect position to expand his empire even further when the Russian government would need additional money. Through the Loan for Shares program he proposed to President Yeltsin, Potanin acquired over 20 formerly state-owned enterprises, including 35% of Nornickel, which produces a quarter of the world's refined nickel and nearly half of its palladium, an expensive metal used in every automobile. He also controls Petrovax, a leading pharmaceutical company, and he has significant stakes in real estate and energy as well. His two yachts are worth a combined $250 million, fit with helipads and elevators to travel between their several decks. He also funded $2.5 billion in development for the 2014 Winter Olympics in Sochi. Potanin's known wealth can buy him the entirety of the car manufacturer Hyundai, and still have a billion left over. Not all oligarchs started as prominent bankers. Some came from a modest background with no money or political power, like Alexei Mordashov. After studying engineering and economics in university, Mordashov began working at a steel mill called Severstal, quickly working his way up to the company's financial director in 1992. Soon after, the company was privatized and shares were issued to Mordashov and the rest of the workers. Mordashov accumulated a majority stake by creating investment funds to buy the shares that were owned by the other workers. He eventually became CEO and continued to expand Severstal by acquiring steel, coal, and other mining companies in Russia and the United States. He used his wealth from Severstal to enter Europe's tourism industry, purchasing 25% of TUI Travel, one of the world's largest tourism companies. He also acquired significant stakes in a major bank, media conglomerates, and mobile phone operators. Along with mansions and private jets, Mordashov carries on the tradition of excessive super yachts with his $500 million vessel called Nord. Another oligarch that was at the right place at the right time was Leonid Mikkelsen. Mikkelsen started as a foreman at a gas pipeline constructing company and worked his way up to chief engineer. When the company became privatized in the mid-90s, he and other managers gained control of the factories and became owners. Mikkelsen then created an oil and gas exploration company called Novatech, which would go on to be Russia's second biggest gas producer. Several years later, Russia's largest gas producer, Gazprom, bought 20% of Mikkelsen's Novatech for $2.3 billion, but he still holds about a quarter of the company. 
Through this and the other petrochemical companies he has stakes in, his wealth has grown to nearly 24 billion. Mikkelsen has one of the world's largest art collections, a $150 million super yacht, and jets worth an upwards of 70 million each. His wealth is around the equivalent to the GDP of Iceland. The company that bought part of Mikkelsen's Novatech shares does a large part of its business with the Rotenbergs, oligarch brothers that own nearly 200 companies across a dozen countries on multiple continents. Arkady and Boris started out in Russia's gas industry, trading petroleum products. Childhood friends with Vladimir Putin, Arkady Rotenberg was put in charge of a liquor conglomerate created by Putin when he became president of Russia. It grew to control 30% of Russia's vodka market. A year later, the Rotenbergs formed S&P Bank, which grew to a point where it was servicing 40 Russian cities. This bank also invested in companies that service Gazprom, including construction, gas, and pipe companies. A few years after opening S&P Bank, the Rotenbergs became one of Russia's main suppliers of large diameter gas pipes, and were a critical partner of Gazprom. It's unknown how much the Rotenbergs truly have, but to show the scale of their operations, they were paid $45 billion by Gazprom to build a 1,500-mile pipeline to the Arctic Circle. The brothers have benefited from countless other construction contracts that were likely inflated through political connections. These contracts include things like bridges, highways, and additional pipelines, including most of Gazprom's pipelines. They go through great lengths to conceal their assets through offshore shell companies and bank accounts. The Rotenbergs are examples of modern oligarchs created during Putin's presidency. Instead of inheriting old companies from the state, they entered industries through powerful political connections. Oligarchs like this were part of the extremely trusted few that made up Putin's circle of business elites. They often take on projects that the Russian government doesn't want to fund or manage itself, but is willing to support. Some oligarchs did not take over factories or have connections in politics or banking. Several of them made independent fortunes like Alisher Usmanov, who made his initial wealth in the shortage market, producing plastic bags, an item that became scarce after the collapse of the USSR. He then took on roles at various investment and finance companies where he traded in industries such as mining, lumber, and telecommunications. He acquired significant stakes in mining companies, including Nornickel, and Baikal Mining Company, which is involved in one of the largest copper operations in the world. He owns a major stake in the largest phone company in Russia and was also once head of Gazprom's investment subsidiary. Uzmanov is unique in that he is one of the more technology-forward oligarchs, one of the few that ventured outside of Russia's natural resources. He bought an 8% stake in Facebook for $800 million in 2009, and he was an early investor in Alibaba, Airbnb, and Twitter, making tens of billions from these investments alone. His investment in Facebook is estimated to have returned over $5 billion to him a few years after the company IPO'd. Usmanov owns mansions around London and Russia, a $450 million super yacht, and a $150 million private jet. Although his wealth was not a direct result of privatization like many other oligarchs, his initial success was enabled by the collapse of the Soviet Union and his business skills, allowing him to participate in the new economy at the highest levels. There are dozens of oligarchs like these, and it's estimated that around 35% of wealth in Russia is owned by just 100 people. The loan for shares program that helped cause this transfer of wealth did, however, force a restructuring of extremely inefficient state-owned enterprises, lifted the Russian stock market, and drove a commodity boom, making the Russian economy competitive once again. Although there were major flaws in Russia's economic reform and significant power ended up in the hands of a few people, there was potential for the alternative to have a worse result. If Yeltsin hadn't won the election in 1996 after the Loan for Shares program was implemented, there was a high probability that the country would fall back into communist rule and may have further deteriorated the economy. The initial chaos of the privatization attempts did, however, expose rampant corruption and in some cases, organized crime. 